I mean, ice cream maker, ice cream machines can be pretty tricky. Dishwashers, I've always been super against those things. I mean, I struggle to turn on lawnmowers. I... <laughs> fighters welcome once again to the mosh pit with your outspoken hosts myself michelle brianne and kelly what is up ladies how are we feeling today hey 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 hello hello i mean feeling as good as you can be in this, this life yeah. in this climate right now you got a pandemic you got protests you got people being treated like crap it's it's, it's hard but you know we got our music to keep us going Yep. yep, true that. At least yep. we're here and we're together, and that's got me excited for this episode. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Yeah, the world's on fire, <laughs> and uh, but we we keep on trucking on. And you know, it's got me really, it's got me feeling really, really punk. Because you know, if you take punk back to its origins, it's pretty political. So we're gonna, you know, take a turn for the quote unquote political. And I put that in very aggressive air quotes because uh, caring about human rights shouldn't really be political. As we all know, uh, aside from the pandemic, which we've talked about in nearly every episode since we started, uh, there is a lot going on with a lot of civil unrest. Uh, and, you know, it affects all of us in the scene just as much as it is a hot topic item in the larger world, um, you know, in this moment in history. So we're kind of going to get into that and how it's affecting the scene. And we've got a really great guest to kind of keep talking about it in terms of the pop punk scene. So if you're not down to rage against the machine with us, we are totally cool with that. You can fuck right off because we don't want you anyway. So let's open up the protests. Time for music news. So, uh, speaking of raging against the machine, uh, there has been a lot of, uh, you know, bands speaking up about what's going on, and uh, one of which was Tom Morello of Rage Against the Machine, and uh, it's caused quite a stir. There's been a lot of fans that have not been about it. Uh, one in particular fan, his uh, comment went viral because Tom responded to him, said, uh, I used to be a fan until your political opinions come out music is my sanctuary and the last thing i want to hear is political bullshit when i'm listening to music as far as <laughs> i'm concerned you and pink are completely done keep running your mouth and ruining your fan base um <laughs> cool bro uh, and uh tom morello responded quite perfectly might i add what music of mine were you a fan of that didn't contain political bs i need to know so i can delete it from the catalog <laughs> Boom, roasted. No. Uh, but it, so actually, good. Uh, I mean, it's fantastic that he's, you know, kind of really engaging. And I think, you know, um, with everything that's going on, it's not enough to kind of, you know, speak your mind, but to call out people that are like, oh, well, this doesn't involve me, so I don't care kind of thing. And I don't want to be a part of it. Uh, you know, and others kind of joined in on, uh, you know, saying stuff to this guy. He goes, uh, the, one uh, other Twitter user said, the people angrily denouncing Rage Against the Machine for Tom Morello's leftist politics is one of the most hilarious things I have ever seen on the internet. What machine did you think they have been raging against for decades? The ice cream <laughs> machine? The ATM? Lawnmowers? Um, so good. Hilarious. I mean, ice, cream maker, ice cream machines can be pretty tricky, so... It could, it could be that. You know, it might might have been that one that they were raging <clears throat> against. Who knows? Dishwashers, I've always been super against those things. <laughs> I mean, I struggle to turn on lawnmowers, I, so I rage against them sometimes. Yeah, this dude's super reasonable. Yeah. 
<laughs> but you know, I mean, it comes down to, I mean, the pop punk scene has kind of evolved a little bit more into like a sugar coated version of the punk scene. There's a, you know, angsty teen kind of stuff. Like, you know, I hate my hometown relationships, this, that, and the other thing. But you know, it's undertones come from punk and punk is very politically driven. And obviously Rage Against the Machine has been, you know, all about that. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think it's ridiculous for people to like, just be like, I don't want it in my music. What have you have been listening to it for ages? <laughs> it's so wild. Also, I'm... like almost every band on the face of the planet has had some kind of like political stance. Like, it, don't be so naive. Right. Yeah. And for me, for me, like I've always found it ridiculous when people say celebrities and musicians and everything they can't have a political opinion i you know just because you know they're oh, in, like shut up and dribble yeah like they're just they're like in the public spotlight and like i don't care about your politics whether you're conservative or liberal or whatever you know left right libertarian fuck it all you know i <laughs> if if you are a human being and you know politics affects your life and that is celebrities like you know as much as everybody else then they have a right to talk about you know how they feel about political or social issue they have every right to talk about it so i mean it's it's just silly for them to be like no no politics in my entertainment yeah mm -hmm. and that this it, this also kind of introduced the idea of cancel culture too like as far as i'm concerned you and pink are completely done like okay one, you've been listening to this band for how long and now, like, suddenly you actually realize what they're talking about, so you're going to cancel them? It just, I don't know. Yeah, the cognitive dis dissonance with some people is just outrageous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look at you pulling out the college terms. I'm smart! Someone <laughs> paid attention. Uh, but speaking of Rage Against the Machine, there's, um... There's been a cool cover that was released in the last week or so. Travis Barker and Machine Gun Kelly covered Rage Against the Machines Killing in the Name. And they um, they attended a protest and took some video there and then also filmed like a little video of them playing this cover as well. So there's a, a music video for it out on YouTube. It shows, you know, them at the protests and, and the description of the song post. They said they wrote this song in 1992. It's been 28 years since and every word still applies. And that's just like, it, it's so crazy. Some of the, some of the lyrics from Killing in, uh, Killing in the Name. Um, some of those that work forces are the same that burn crosses. Those who died are justified for wearing the badge. They're the chosen whites. Like, it's, Eek. I mean, I know. It's, and then it's, you say, and then, you know, people think, like, oh, that wasn't political. How how can you go, like, like, what were you singing about? What did you think you were singing along to? <laughs> Some of those that hold office are the same that burn crosses. Like, all of that. It's so, it's 100% still relevant, unfortunately. But I mean, I'm I'm glad they kind of resurrected that song and made their own version of it to to bring that back to the forefront and just show how long all of this has has been such a problem. For sure. I mean, you know, not only you know, kind of doing a cover of it, kind of um, gives like you know their audience something to think about because you know I I mean you know travis has been part of blink for ages and i've never i've never really followed travis's side project so i i can't say for sure but you know him and machine gun kelly i don't i think i've ever really considered them political artists but you know mm -hmm. having them kind of take this on and kind of spread that message i think is like a step in the right direction for our scene and you know kind of all the bands taking ownership and um of the privilege they have, you know, especially like guys like Travis Barker and Machine Gun Kelly, you know, two white dudes that this shit doesn't typically affect. This whole thing of them covering, you know, an older song that still is relevant today is very similar to when um, the band Bad Wolves, it's more, you know, metal rock cover, um, but they cover the song Zombie by the Cranberries. 
which talks about their bombs and their guns and, you know, all this crazy stuff. It was, I forget when it was, I think it was released in 2018, but, um, it, it, it's very similar to, like, a song that was recorded a long time ago that was supposed to be, like, let's change this, and then no one did shit about it, and it's just, like, a vicious cycle, you know? But hopefully, um, other, uh, people in the scene are trying to fight this cycle and put a stop to it. So, um, aside from supporting just the black community at protests, bands and labels have been sharing information, donating to organizations, supporting the cause, and amplifying black voices. Uh, for example, Hopeless Records will be donating to multiple organizations, such as Black Girls Code, Campaign Zero, and Color of Change. Yeah, they had a whole list, um, that they, they were, yeah, they had a whole list. That's, that was just a few of them. Um, but yeah, no, they're, they're, uh, very committed to it, and I, I dig it. Right. But then, like, individual bands are also doing stuff. Bands like State Champs and Mando Overboard are creating merch in which proceeds go to organizations supporting black causes. So another smaller way that bands can, you know, do stuff. Um, there's other bands like Sleep On It, who have released songs on Bandcamp to help raise money. Um, Waster raffled off ten prizes, including one free entry to their one of their headlining shows. Uh, to Oh, wait, for life? What?! They raffled off one ticket per le- for for the rest of their lives. That's yeah. insane, man. That'd be so awesome. I was too preoccupied with how to pronounce their name. I didn't fully read. The Which I'm pretty sure you still pronounce it wrong. Um, okay, I thought we said W S T R. I had no Whatever. idea. Waster W S T R. I don't fucking know. All I know is listeners. Listeners, we need your help. How do you pronounce this band? W S T R, all capitals. What? No, how do you thought, say their band name? So me and Callie always called it WSTR, but we were just having this discussion, and Brienne didn't know how to pronounce it, and she would have said it. I was I would have called it Worcester. I looked it up. Apparently, it's Waster. I mean, or I mean, I could be Waster. Uh, I could be wrong. I would say Waster. No. And I'm not gonna lie. When I saw it, I I was just like Worcester, like Massachusetts city. But I mean, that works yeah. too. Um, whatever this band is, they're doing an awesome thing by raffling off one free ticket to their concerts for the rest of the for eternity which is insane uh and all the money goes towards black lives matter movement um and a old faithful here on the mosh pit the main has raised over 15 grand to support the black community um amazing many, that's fantastic which is, that's why they're my crazy. Fave. I know. And I mean, like I've, like I've always said, they, they are a band that has truly known how to build a community around their band. And I mean, it's clear by the donations that, you know, mm-hmm. they were able to raise how dedicated that fan base is. The 8123 family goes hard. And then a lot of other bands from, you know, from in our scene, from all, from our faves, All Time Low, to uh, Amberlynn, and a bunch of mainstream pop artists like Dua Lipa and Megan Trainer. They've all taken the hashtag Artists for Black Lives pledge and have donated, have been donating and highlighting different organizations that need support on a daily basis. So not just necessarily the Black Lives Matter movement in general, like people's bail for getting out of jail for the protests and, you know, all that other kind of stuff to help fight the, the systemic issues. And I think that's fantastic because, you know, um, with social media, I think it kind of perverts movements a lot and it turns it into a trend when something Mm -hmm. like this needs to be constant and uh you know enduring and you know a week from now when two weeks from now a month from now when protests finally die down because they will um you know it, it is exhausting to kind of be constantly fighting this so they will die down but um you know we need to keep thinking about all of this once that Stop it, it once we move on to the next news cycle, you know? Yeah, um, speaking of the social media aspect of it, like, um, Lady Gaga actually did a thing recently where she was like, I am not the expert on this, I am a white woman, so I am turning my plat- my Instagram account over to, I think it's, she said 10 days, she's turning it over to 10 different organizations, and the first one was, oh god, the Stacey Abrams, um, uh, Fair Fight. There we go. It's a political one that helps try to get people who are, you know, disenfranchised for voting and fair voting rights across the state. You know how, like, for a while in Alabama, or not Alabama, um, Georgia, where she's from, they were trying to purge a lot of the voter rolls, or if your name is spelled wrong on your license and it's spelled differently on their rolls, you can't vote. Like, shit like that, like, her organization goes in and fights, so Lady Gaga's been doing a lot of, like, that kind of 
you know, highlighting more important organizations that might not be as well known. Yeah, I mean, that's that's super important. Like, um, there's there's definitely a lot of celebrities out there doing that. I know, um, I, I think it's like a whole movement. I, I uh, Stephanie Beatrice from, um, an actual, actually a cop show, uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, um, the actress who plays Rosa Diaz, she uh, turned her Instagram over. I think a lot of celebrities are doing this to give them the platform that they need right now because we have a lot of momentum. It, it, it's it's the time to really make all these changes. I mean, so far we're, you know, three weeks in, however long we're in, and there's been a lot of progress in, you know, justice for a lot of the Black community. But there's still so much more to be done and we need to keep going for sure. Agreed. Um, moving on, we're going to continue on to uh, a little bit lighter note, um, the tours and live streams section of our broadcast um (laughs) guys get pumped though like our next episode is gonna be forever and ever times infinity day because new five glory is gonna be releasing their new album so we'll be doing get ready for our next track by track we're we're gonna have a great time with track by track just like we did with wake up sunshine um, but the cool thing is, is that Newfound Glory is actually having a release party. It's a 24 hour live stream concert on June 19th. Um, we've got, uh, we'll put up the, t- the link to the tickets where you can buy them on our Instagram, all of the socials, and all that fun stuff. Um, they're doing 40 old and new songs. Um, and then portion of the proceeds will be going to colorofchange.org. So another great um, charity. But, um, It'll be, they, they said that it's going to be, like, 24 hours from, like, a, whatever time where you're living or whatever. They were saying about how, like, oh, is it downloadable? Like, no, it's supposed to be a concert. Like, they had, like, a question and answer. I was reading through this yeah. album. I was like, you're, this is ridiculous. Of course not. Because it's, it's supposed to be, like, the live concert experience. You experience it in the yeah. moment. Um, and that that's great. And I think it's super exciting, you know. Um Brienne mentioned all these ways that bands are helping me whether it's merch or you know releasing songs you know or now you know we've talked about on the show before like how prevalent live streams are becoming now because of coronavirus and you know using that to support the all these causes that we've been talking about fantastic stuff I was thinking about this earlier today I think it's even more powerful all of these things that bands are doing to especially like give in a monetary way because you know obviously we were going through this pandemic at the same time and they're not able to make money how they normally make money by playing shows so when I see all these bands like going out of their way to make sure that they're contributing in a positive way to to some of these causes I I just love to see that and it just is even more powerful coming out of this pandemic you love to see it you love to see it um one more live stream that we wanted to share with our listeners is a um an event that was hosted by emo night la and it was about racism in the punk and alternative scene and it was a panel conversation led by black voices and emo night la opened up their platform to these people to talk about and discuss racism in the scene and it was moderated by Courtney Coles. She is a photographer in the scene and the panelists were um, Jason Alon f- from Fever 333, Hanif Abdurakib, who's a writer, Sky Accord of Issues, Aaron Brown um, who works with Emo Night, and Jordan Calhoun of Heart Like War and it was it was a really really great um great live stream it is still available um for anyone to listen to and we can share that that link for everyone to go back and review review that conversation it was super powerful they were all very passionate and um it's it's really important i think for everyone to continue to educate themselves and continue to have and start some tough conversations one thing that really stuck out to me and you know as a white woman i can't relate to the black experience at all obviously um but you know one thing that uh sky uh of issues mentioned uh 
that resonated with me was that you know when he'd go to warped he'd have this mental list of black artists on stage and you know whenever they throw some r&b or post hardcore into it he was able to really relate to that and you know the best way that i'm able to understand that is that you know um on the show before we've mentioned that as women female artists in the scene definitely stick out to us and we cling to them a bit um because you know you're able to relate to someone who's gone through the same experiences as you have so you know i can really see where he felt that way about seeing black artists and you know it's it's uh a a very you know a realization moment for me to you know kind of how unseen the black community must feel in the pop punk scene for and you know considering for me the pop punk scene has always been welcoming despite you know it being very male dominated you know for sure and then just to to close that out they they talked about how do we keep keep this movement going forward how do we keep doing better what do they want to see from their allies and something that stuck out to me was um they want to see empathy empathy with mindfulness and i thought that really hit and they they talked about um like we don't want your empathy if it's empty and like you have to take a moment to really um to really acknowledge your privilege and be mindful of how um, how your experiences are different and then continue to empathize. And um, if you have power or a platform, continue to use that and amplify, um, amplify black, black voices and give deserving opportunities to, to people of color, not just for the next week. Yeah. And I mean, I definitely think that's hopefully what the the shift that we're seeing with all the bands, all the labels, it's going to stick, you know? And I mean, um, though we have a small platform, as we kind of uh, made a point to say on our social platforms throughout all, all this that's been going on, is that, you know, we are here for the Black community and, you know, we're here to use our platform for good, as small as it may be. We are using it to amplify black voices and so we're excited to announce our guest (laughs) washers as you've noticed this episode has been super focused on the social issues uh and we're gonna keep going with that so all these issues that impact the scene particularly the black lives matters movement uh, you know as we are in a moment where people are paying attention to it so whether you're black and it directly affects you or someone who supports the black community Uh, We really need to maintain the momentum to make a significant change to racist systems. And, uh, you know, I think we've mentioned it, but in case you weren't aware, I literally just did say it. uh, We are a bunch of white girls. (laughs) So while we support the black community, we can't speak for them. And, uh, you know, so in our effort to push the narrative forward and amplify black voices in this moment of historic change, we have the pleasure of introducing our guest today to speak on racism in the pop punk scene, Crystal McRae. Crystal McRae is a born and bred New Yorker who runs the DIY indie music site, Scenes from the Underground, focusing on up and coming bands from New York City and sometimes beyond. She also puts together several showcases a year under the same name uh, with a special events background and an ear and eye for bands who stand for something bigger than themselves as well as being good musicians crystal does her best to uplift and give everyone a seat at the table crystal welcome to the mosh pit hello thank you guys for having me i'm excited. so excited we are excited to have you as well uh so how are you doing today you know i'm good we're hanging in you know as you know one does when the world's a dumpster fire but you know <laughs> <laughs> Exactly how we described it earlier to, earlier on in the episode. <laughs> the world is on fire. Yes. Um, but, you know, good things come from the fire. Um, and, you know, a good thing is that we're chatting with you. Yeah. Um, so before we get really into the deep stuff, mm-hmm. why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, what's your favorite band and why is it All Time Low? I'm, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we love All Time Low here at the Mosh Pits. So. Yeah, me too. Um, all right. Uh, favorite band? That's going to be hard. So I am a My Chem fangirl. Um, I will not deny that. Um, <laughs> it is about three months to their reunion tour. And I know that everything is currently canceled and postponed this year. It's three months to their tour. So I'm hoping it happens. But if it doesn't, I'll be fine. Um, just because obviously, 
everything is a shit show and you know I, I would rather us be safe and sorry you know um I love the main um I am a champs fan I'm a state champs fan too um yes, so- yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm still very a little upset that Tony left the bands I love Tony but yeah you know, the hair I for real like he's, he's just a peach man I mean they all are but you know Tony the peach but um yeah so I'm a born and bred New Yorker uh I run the DIY music site scenes from the underground here in New York um and then I also throw shows under the same name um and it's, and it's kind of cool because I have like this um really awesome I guess like intersection of like DIY like punk and pop punk in my in my scene and then just being part of the larger scene and it, it's awesome like it's just like oh well you know I know real friends is coming to play on Thursday but then but then all my friends have shows this weekend so it's like yes social calendar support your scene so <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 awesome it's awesome so, um, so you mentioned your Scenes from the Underground site. Uh, how did you get started with all of that? Um, so Scenes from the Underground um, is turning three next month, which is so weird for me. Wow. Um, Ooh, congratulations. Thank you. That's yeah. Awesome. So uh, I started writing about music and being just so in love with music at a very young age. Um, I had a music blog in college and then I would... I ran my school at my school's newspaper. So I would kind of like, you know, sneak in like little like music snippets here and there. Um, and then the blog that I had in college, I kind of let it kind of just like die down a bit once I graduated and went to grad school. So I was like, well, it's not really like, I don't really have like a set like plan for this or like a set focus and whatnot. So I kind of just like, you know, let it kind of just fizzle out over the years. And then uh, I had a conversation with a few girlfriends one night at dinner and like one of my friends was like you really know a lot about music and I was like well have you met me like of course I do (laughs) and uh and uh I was like all right well maybe I should you know start like another site or blog and you know lo and behold that that like July 4th weekend uh scenes from the underground was born and it my focus at uh, being a little older now it's like I was like all right well I can focus on all the bands coming up in my scene because New York City has no shortage of bands coming up and coming out and I mean Mm -hmm. the Brooklyn scene by itself it's such a mix of punk and there's some hardcore punk and there's some bands are kind of like post-punk and pop punk and just all of that so I was like well looks like I have a focus now on smaller bands and fast forward two years ago I started throwing my my own showcases and uh, that story by itself is insane Um, (laughs) the first showcase I ever threw it was a pre warp Tour showcase Um, and oh oh, yeah oh it's we're gonna talk fam and um, (laughs) (laughs) I love it I'm here for it let's do it (laughs) yes and it was a pre warp Tour showcase and it was three bands from New York it was Fat Heaven Treads and Niloceros um who were actually playing local dates of Vans Warped Tour that year. And that, especially for me as someone who has been, go- who, who was going to Warped Tour for a while, um, being like a pop punk and punk rock kid and like, just like, you know, I mean, obviously it was ending. So for all of us that kind of grew up on that, we're like, oh shit, Warped Tour's over? Like what? So to kind of tell the full story, um, it started in fall 2017. Um, I had gotten a hold of Kevin Lyman's email because, you know. Oh, damn. Well, I mean, we have, a, we have a, some really intense feelings about Kevin Lyman on this podcast. I, and by uh, we, we mean Michelle. Michelle has good? very strong feelings. Are they good or bad? We probably talk off the record about this later. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Trust me. I have cursed Kevin Lyman very thoroughly on this podcast. It does not need to be off the record. Okay. They are bad feelings. All right. All right. Well, We'll get to that tea later, but um, <laughs> let's, let's, uh, let's uh, spill some tea, y'all. And um, so anyway, long story short, I emailed Kevin Lyman. I was like, hey, my name is Crystal. I run the music site Scenes from the Underground here in New York City. Um, at the time, I was doing this cool kind of like, I guess like monthly like video show interviewing bands from New York. And I'm like, here are some bands that I want to see on local stages for the final cross-country bands warp front local dates. 
and I sent him 11 bands from New York and then I got eight on so wow, that's awesome and nice. it was crazy for me because if you had told me I would be doing that in college I would have been like I'm gonna be a journalist for the New York Times like what are you talking about <laughs> or I'm gonna be an ARF <laughs> and then I was like oh shit I got bands on work tour <laughs> Um, so that was really cool. And obviously what comes next when that happens, you're like, well, maybe we should throw like a showcase slash party and celebrate. So obviously Fat Heaven, Trez, and the last person I mentioned earlier, they were on Warped. Um, and that was really amazing. And that was like my first showcase. And then from there, it's like, I've done two holiday showcases an acoustic showcase, a spring showcase. And, you know, they're all bands from New York that I really love and respect as people. Um, sometimes I'll throw in like artists from outside New York city, because they either come heavily recommended from other friends in the scene or they're, you know, someone that I know personally. And then it kind of just goes from there. So uh, that was, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is super cool. And uh, I think, so we relate a little bit to that, um, that journey of, you know, you're doing something in college and you want to kind of make more of it. Yeah. We started um, the mosh pit or, Brianne really started the mosh pit as a college radio show. Um, and then Michelle and I joined in and now here we are years and years out of, um, out of college, kind of trying to, trying to reinvigorate that, um, that muscle, but, uh, mosh pit's been around for 10 years, guys. 10 Wait, years. really? It was fall of yeah. 2000 or no, so it was, yeah spring of 2010 so exactly 10 years in this january that's amazing yeah. so we're probably all around the same age group then and also i have to give you all props i think you guys are one of the few music podcasts run by women that i know of. Wait, that's oh. we're trying <laughs> well, <laughs> gotta gotta hold it down no you have to and like it's funny though <laughs> gotta represent no you have to and like because here's the thing it's like you know we have a whole generation of girls coming up after us and this is something that I kind of, mm-hmm. you know, thought about running um, a music site, being a girl of color in the New York City scene. You know, it's like there's mm-hmm. girls coming up that want to do what we do at some point. Right. And mm-hmm. I want to encourage them. And like, you know, it's almost like you kind of have to play this like role of like a mentor almost or or this kind of yeah. like guide. It's like, hey, like we kind of didn't know what we were doing. But now that we know, we want to kind of push you to do it because it's our place too. Like it's our fucking scene too. Why should we kind of be like in the background now? You know? Exactly. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, we've Love definitely it. talked about it on the podcast before that, you know, um, women are definitely underrepresented in the scene. So we, uh, the women that are in the scene, the rest of us look up to them. Right. And, you know, obviously, like you said, the, for us to kind of be talking about it, being those pop punk advocates, right? it's a, uh, yeah, I, I did, honestly, I haven't even thought about it that way, but, Look at you telling, <laughs> making us mentors and stuff. It's it's <laughs> true, and it, it's funny though because like I'm kind of thankful things are definitely shifting in many ways. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done, and and obviously we're probably gonna talk about that later. But like I know, um, so obviously getting eight bands on Warp Tour, you know, two of my friends' bands had me on crew, so I was with one band in New Jersey on crew, and another band in Long Island on crew, and I have to tell you it was a really badass feeling. I'm like, oh shit, like I'm on crew with the local band. This is so cool. Like this is like, you know, (laughs) but then you really think about it. I'm walking around like, you know, uh, wherever we were in New Jersey for Warp Tour that year. I don't remember in 2018, but there's no one else that looked like me. Like I was like, okay, so where are all the female crew members, number one? And number two, where are Mm -hmm. all the female and male people of color crew members Mm -hmm. that's a problem and since we can talk shit a little bit um (laughs) (laughs) you know for a tour that had been around for 20 something years i expected more from kevin lyman i mean i yeah i did not yeah And, and and I'm not going to lie, this might sound like a shady comment, but I'm going to say it because clearly we're all badasses here. Um, oh, say <laughs> it. Just because you have a lot of white women and, you know, queer folk in your, you know, on, you know, like in your circle, that's great. But that's not diverse because where 
are the indigenous people where are the people of color where are mm-hmm. the queer people of color like where is differently body people in general like you know you're, you're missing something and mm-hmm. i don't know if y'all have been on band twitter lately it's been a shit show let me tell you <laughs> oh, have you been no, on band I, twitter i haven't um i have a, a little bit but um mostly i've been uh seeing the good things that I'm on instagram from bands so the good things on instagram but man twitter it's like so i don't know how y'all feel about alternative press right now uh, uh after what i saw about their comments about austin carlisle i'm feeling a little hesitant i guess towards them that is fair so my thing with alt press and i i actually did look up their editorial board like on their website you know, you're talking mm-hmm. about how you have mainly women and queer folk in your, you know, on your circle. But then if that's the case, then e- why do you keep silencing victims of, or, or I guess, well, not, well, what, mm-hmm. what, yes, victims and sexual assault survivors. So if you don't know the Austin Carlisle story, which I didn't even know he was a horrible person because I never followed up mice and men. Um, but anyway, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't care. I just saw on Instagram. He's like, yeah, I found Jesus, and like he has all these health problems and whatnot. Oh God! But anyway, totally understand. Yeah. We echo those sentiments. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but like you know, if fifteen women come forward, or fifteen people come forward, and say they've all been assaulted or abused by this one guy. And you sit there and interview all of them and then you're ready to run this story and then you decide to kill the story because you're being threatened by a lawsuit. That's awful. Like That's not journalism. It's not journal exactly. Yeah, it's not journalism. You've just made this traumatic event even worse. And I have to say this, this is not the first time Alt Press has done this. Um, there's been so many instances where they're like you know like they protected abusers over survivors Mm. like this is the first time i yeah oh there's more tea i mean johnny craig they interviewed i think all three of his exes that were sexually assaulted and abused and then didn't run the story um Uh, oh wow i you know i wasn't not aware of all these things at all i i found out about this recent one with austin carlisle but i didn't know about all these other things it definitely puts a alt press in a definitely questionable um, light very questionable exactly and they, you know yeah. honestly they've um for like you know an alternative zine mm-hmm. and whatnot uh they've definitely been declining in terms of content they post a lot of stuff that mm-hmm. doesn't really feel relevant it's not, yeah yeah or even if it is relevant it's like here's one tidbit of information and then we're going to regurgitate everything that's happened about that person in the last five years it's like cool <laughs> how about you just give me new information that I don't already know. Right. Or, or exactly. they're quick to jump jump on stories without confirming facts. And that's not good either. So, but like, you know, like you're talking about how like your crew is mainly women. I, I was just going back to that. And I was just like, no, it's not though. Because if you look on the editorial site, who's still in charge? Mike Shea is still in charge. Jason Pettigrew is still in charge. And then they were like, oh, you know, we're promoting uh, this woman to our editor in chief. And I'm like, that's not going to fix it, though, because because unless like you really actively work to do better, it's not it doesn't mean anything like now. It's, yeah, it's it feels, a hollow thing. Yeah. yeah, it feels contrived because it's almost like they were forced. Exactly. Into it. So, you know, stuff like that. It's just it's like y'all have been around since 1985. Right. So we're talking, you guys are around 35. So y'all should really yeah. know better. Yeah, they've, they've had enough time to get their shit together and they just haven't. Yeah, exactly. So that's my take on yeah, that. So, sure. yep. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We definitely are, yeah, after the same reading that, that, yeah, on yeah. the same page. I guess switching gears a little bit. We found found your project through your collaboration that you recently did with 8123. Yay. And, um, you know, you're a main fan. We're a fan of the main. And would you be able to share a little bit more about that collaboration, how that came about, how the... Oh, yeah, of course. Been? So um, so I actually met Chelsea last year when uh, the main was in New York. Oh, cool. Chelsea's amazing. Um, Chelsea is the street, street team, team manager. Press, is that right? Uh, now impact okay uh obviously the team is mainly her and cool. Tim. 
Um, and Tim is Pat's brother. Mm -hmm. So, you know, (laughs) keeping on the family. But uh, I met Chelsea last year in New York when the main was here uh, doing their press uh, for You Are OK. And I had actually emailed Chelsea previously because I wanted, wanted to do an interview with the main via email. Just really, you know, nothing out of the ordinary. Kind of just talking about the new project, how it came about, um, songwriting, all that good stuff. And when I met her at the YouTube space, I was like, oh, uh, I'm Crystal. I'm from the scenes from the underground. I actually emailed you. She goes, oh, hi. And I have to say, Chelsea is one of the most efficient people. So I met her during the (laughs) YouTube space interview. And then maybe like a week later, I already had my interview questions answered by Garrett. And, uh, and uh, off the bat, I just liked her personality, liked her attitude. Um, She's one of those people that you want to talk about, like really trying to work to be more inclusive and more diverse. Like one of the things I liked about her was the fact that she didn't want to sign any more you know cis white dude bands to 8123 like they wanted more diversity so that off the bat just kind of just made me like I was like she's awesome I like her a lot and then you know fast forward this year I had kind of started a uh I guess like a musician's corner op-ed section on scenes from the underground kind of just giving like you know people in the scene the chance to kind of vent on certain topics and the topics were things that we either talked about you know just as a conversation or kind of things that you know I thought were important for people to hear that no one else was really talking about so with Chelsea I emailed her in March I was like hey you know um hope you're doing well um would you mind writing this op-ed for scenes from the underground about you know what local bands and smaller bands and kind of learn from like you know running their own collectives or independent labels and even eventually festivals because let's be real like you know, when I think of bands who I think really carry the torch in terms of our scene that are doing something that's just going beyond just their normal tours, I think of the main. Because let's be real, like what other band mm-hmm. do you know can put out what well, they have seven albums out and like maybe one or two were major label releases, give or take. And, you know, they've kind of really built their fan base up and the fact that they don't do the paid meet and greets, which I think is amazing. Oh, yeah. Really? You know, mm-hmm. not only do they run 8123 fast, but they also have sad summer fest. So they're a band that's running two festivals, um, just stand up dudes. So it's like, you know, that's kind of like the bands that I think um, a lot of upcoming pop punk bands and poppy mole bands should kind of be looking to in the sense of, talking about like you know just how they run everything and just how they treat their fans like that's a band that I think it just doesn't ain't one job of that and their team is fantastic because I think that um I, I don't know if people want to debate me on this or not but I mean if you want to fine I think a band <laughs> I mean <laughs> whatever um I think a band is really only as good as a team behind them um and For sure, totally. totally and yes so, yeah I mean they can't do everything no. so there's got to be people to right. help them and obviously we've all been in this scene for a long time so we kind of you know we've probably seen really good you know teams behind bands and really shit ones so let's be really real um but um but <laughs> anyway i wanted her to write an op-ed for that um this this was around the time they started announcing like sad summer fest Actually, no, Sad Summer Fest might have already been announced, but this is probably before everything went, everything kind of got shut down. So she had to, she had to decline, right. which I was like, all right, we'll revisit some other time. Um, fast forward a few weeks ago, obviously, everyone is reeling um, just from everything happening in the world between, you know, watching Ahmaud Arbery be killed on camera and then George Floyd be killed on mm-hmm. camera, Breonna Taylor being killed, and then just still being in a global pandemic. Um, it was just a lot. And uh, so Chelsea reached out, you know, just kind of checking in and just kind of talking about um, how, I guess, like the main and their team and whatnot just kind of really like admitted where they kind of fell short and just wanted to be better allies and were having the tough conversations, wanting to ed- educate themselves. And she was just like, hey, I really admire you as a writer and activist. And I love what you post because Chelsea's in Canada. I don't know if people knew that or not. She's she's from Toronto so she's not really in the states so she's seeing stuff you know from a totally different lens than we are who live here and um mm-hmm. she's like you know we really want to amplify our 8123 fan base in the black community you know would you mind writing something 
and I was like, yeah, of course. And she's like, you know, um, she's like, you know, if it's too much, I was like, no, give me a few minutes. Well, a few minutes turned into a few hours, but you know, <laughs> it wound up being that letter, uh, to the, to a letter to white people and just, mm-hmm. you know, how we have to really talk about what's going on in the world and like, none of this is new and, you know, what, you know, your brown friends might really want from you guys, what, want, what, what we might want from, you know, our white friends to do now and, you know, how these conversations are being had. So it kind of just turned into that. So I think they're really yeah. doing, you know, they're doing their best that they can to understand. And I've read some of the other letters on the Impact blog. I think the letter that hit me the most was um, Tony Baldwin's, where she talks about... Um, I don't know if y'all mm-hmm. read her letter or not, or her blog post or not, but uh, she's also a musician, and you know, she's talking yeah. to a friend, and I guess they're talking about um, oh, I forgot they're talking about either Trayvon Martin being killed or something else. Uh, it was either Trayvon Martin or Mike Brown, one of the two, and um, you know, her. I guess like she asked her friend, she's like, you know, she, she was like, you know, would you do that if you didn't know who I was? Like, would you shoot me? And the friend was like, yes. So that one got to me because that was just like, Oof. that is, that's just like, that's, that's our experience though. You know, it's like, you think your friends are all yeah. great and like they're open and then it's like biases come out, racist comments come out and it's just like, ugh. And then um, the one that came out, I think it was last week from the anonymous fan in the scene about. Yeah, that's the one. That I one. I related to that one a lot too. Because being a brown girl in this scene, be it pop emo, pop punk, whatever you want to have it, it's like, yeah, you do face situations like that where it's either microaggressions that are very like kind of hidden or sneaky, or it's just downright awful, just terrible shit going on. Now in yeah. now now I don't know where this fan is based. Um Sometimes in New York, it's kind of a, a kind of like a toss up. So like, you know, you might not have anyone calling you the N word or right not, but you might have someone, you know, getting way too close for comfort in your space, or you might get pushed or shoved more and you're like, what the fuck is going on? Like, do you not see me standing here? Like what? So yeah, no, uh, definitely. I mean, I think kind of what you talked about with 8123 trying to learn and, you know, better themselves be better allies I think you know that's kind of where right. we're at you know um and you know I found you through them um saw you post about the anonymous fan um and you know we really want to amplify the black voices and you know hear your experiences and um you said you related to that fan's perspective so much and um I guess you know kind of beyond like those like microaggressions like what are some other things like you've seen from the as a perspective of a black fan in the um there have been times where i've had to give cis white dudes dirty looks because we can be in a venue and you know let's say it's not a sold out show and there's space but then all of a sudden why are you super close to me or why are you almost touching my you know my backside like what like Mm -hmm. like excuse you like back up um or you know i've been with like a white friend and whatnot and you know they might not have people like pushing past them but i do and i'm like well why is that not that anyone should not not that anyone should get pushed around at a show i think it's awful and it's just so disrespectful but you're just like okay what is that um obviously uh the typical like being pushed and shoved um else has been really awful at a show and so at like with you know being pushed and shoved and everything like um on our last episode we did a little bit of a QA with us to for our fans to get right. to know us a little bit and um i uh i told a story about when i was at a show and this uh this you know little teeny bopper you know i was younger so i was more hot-headed uh she wouldn't take her phone out, off from in front of my face so I got pissed I threw her Ooh. phone and I kicked her uh, like, an, <laughs> like an asshole I was literally but thinking so, of this story Mish as she was like no one should get pushed I'm like Michelle donkey <laughs> kicked someone so <laughs> but so like I, I I admit it I was an asshole I, I I I'm not proud of that moment but you know for me as a white woman like 
you know, you're not really going right. to see repercussions, but like for you as a black fan, you know, these things happen to you, but you, I, I'm, I'm assuming here, like I, you probably feel like you can't reciprocate or react if you get angry or yeah, it becomes too much. Yeah, that's always one of my hard things because sometimes I'm a, t- I have a temper as well sometimes as sweet as I am, but, um, but, uh, <laughs> you know, like it, it, it's, 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 it's almost like a double-edged sword having the gift to not always react to everything. But then sometimes you want to just react so badly just so they know. Be like, don't try it. Like, don't you dare. Like, y- fuck you. <laughs> like, um, and then obviously, <laughs> like, even, like, you know, with other bands in the scene that I really like a lot, like, I've actually, like, skipped shows um, just because, like, you know, you see where someone's playing and you're like, oh, fuck. They're playing at this venue. It's going to be a bunch of cis white dudes being aggro as shit for no reason. I'm going to have to skip the show. And, and honestly, like, and honestly, that, that's sad. It's like, you know, I go to shows constantly, but like, you know, sometimes there are some shows where you just know you're like, I'm gonna have to skip this. Or um, I don't know if y'all are all based in New York or not, but like, if you go to venues like Brooklyn Steel or Music Hall of Williamsburg, they actually have like a little balcony area. So for certain bands mm-hmm. that, you know, let's say are more on the heavier side or like screamo metalcore side. I was like, all right, I'm going to the show, but I'm going right up to the balcony because I know that I don't have to deal with the bullshit in the crowd. Because I've also been at shows too yeah. where it's like, you know, I'm just standing there and then all of a sudden mosh pit breaks out and like, you know, petite little brown girls getting pushed all the way back to the bar area. And that's not cool either. Yeah, for sure. I totally get that. There's definitely concerts I go to where I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to go to the pit tonight because uh, it's just a bunch of bunch of big white dudes that are God, there's like gonna just yeah fuck me up there's like that <laughs> one guy named kyle who's wearing like a shark costume like oh that is God. that is someone who is that has punched me in a pit before so it's i'm not speaking from i'm speaking from a place of or the serious hurt or the chads that like you know oh rip off God. their shirts and they're just like sweating oh. all over you it's like no one wants to see that chad dude and normally the chads and the cows are on the ones that have, have like ugly ass offensive t-shirts and you're just like you're a misogynist oh, thing. I I know. Fuck you, dude. like <laughs> um, exactly or 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 also this at shows like you know i might be at a show and i get there early because i want to be up front and you know it's not going to be like a super rowdy crowd so it's fine but um you know have people trying to like block you and i'm like excuse me like no, I was here. Like, you need to back the fuck up. And sometimes people do. Sometimes people do, or they get all pissy, but I'm just like, no, like, this is more claiming my space now, because I, I have right to be here just as much as you do. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So, you were talking about experiencing it from a fan's perspective, and you had mentioned that you had worked crew before, so what kind, what, like, major obstacles do you see for, like, Black musicians and crew to be able to come into our scene versus, like, maybe other types of music um, out there in terms of obstacles i think just like just like it being just like obvious you're treated differently because of whatever and like it's it's weird it's like oh well definitely well it's weird actually i'm gonna go back um i think just not seeing enough representation in general like honestly like being out on work tour for, for those two days was weird because it was awesome because I was like oh this is so great like crew but then like you're but then like you're walking around and it's like where is everyone else who looks like me like and honestly warp tour is a big tour like a cross country like you know 25 day show that's been around for 25 years or whatnot and still like their diversity was seriously lacking like so if that's warp tour imagine like other tours now i will say um some bands do have like you know female crew members out and whatnot and that's great and that's a start but you know it's 2020 so what is stopping you from actually making your either touring crew or you know just venue staff more diverse at this point you know yeah and so as a you know, seeing all that there's nobody like you on these tours and stuff, does it kind of make it, I suppose, feel alienating that, uh, you know, like, you're maybe wrong in liking this music, because, you know, you don't see anybody else like you liking this music, and uh, um, it's definitely kind of alienating, but I don't feel wrong for liking this music, because Black people help build rock and roll, so 
So hell yeah, they Little did. Richard, Bo <laughs> Diddley, sister Rosetta Tharp, who did the original Hound Dog, by the way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't feel I don't feel bad liking it at all. And honestly, like I actually found like just like pop punk and punk rock when I was like twelve or thirteen, being bullied in junior high, and I felt like I belonged. Like simple plans, welcome to my life, help get me through seventh grade. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! Oh my god yes. So. I feel you. <laughs> no, I fucking belong here. It's everyone else that needs to do the work to realize that, oh shit, like, you know, we kind of co opted this and now we're not giving them credit for it. So I was like, yeah, yeah, so y'all better get get your shit together and uh, realize that, hey, people of color are just, just as valuable in the scene and have always been. Um, so now, like, you know, when people are saying decolonize music, we're basically saying give credit where credit is due and make space for people that, you know, help build this. So, mic drop. <laughs> yes, <snap. laughs> yes, yes, yes. I love it. And, like, let me let me just say, like, the you sharing your experiences is, like, is super eye-opening for mm-hmm. us and, and hopefully for our listeners, too. And, uh, I mean just like the conversation we've had so far, like, I think we obviously, um, empathize, you know, yeah. emp- emp- uh, empathize. I was like, uh, what? I was going to say emphasize, but that was not the word I was looking for. Um, that, you know, we're all, we all right. connect as women in the scene. And, you know, we've talked about how, mm-hmm. you know, we've had some of those same experiences, but it's, it's amplified, right you know, even more for you as, um, as a a person of color in in the scene. So, of um, course, I mean, I already feel like we're friends. We get along really well. Um, (laughs) but I know, um, but I mean, what can, what can we continue to do? And, um, you know, as, as allies, what can we do as part of the scene to encourage more? This is going to be, it's, it's kind of, there's not really like a full definitive answer like you know like the answer is not going to be cut and dry right um Mm -hmm. i will say um i think it needs to start at a level of well well, listening to your friend stories is always a great (laughs) always a great step everyone should be taking and just kind of being there for them if like you know they're uncomfortable at a show be kind of like reassuring them being like hey like how are you feeling right now like because honestly that check-in is so important and oftentimes I go to shows by myself so mm-hmm. there's some shows like I might go with a friend and then some shows I just go solo and then I wind up making friends so it's like oh I feel a little bit you know more at ease now um on a bigger level um I think there needs to be a lot more people of color and women of color um in support roles as ven- in venues um and not just you know in bands it's like, you know, we're photographers, we're writers, we're publicists, we're bookers, we're promoters. So I think venues really have to kind of actively seek out and hire more people of color to make their teams diverse. I think publications, like bigger music publications, like now, obviously, I don't know what caring looks like in terms of their staff or, you know, um, the Aquarian seems like they're really cool, but I don't know what their staff looks like. But like, you know, they need to be more diversified in the publications because then that's more representative of what your scene looks like. So you need to have like, you know, women of color and people of color like writing about, you know, the history of black punk or like, you know, punk bands in general or like, you know, pop punk and like how this all kind of intersects and goes Mm -hmm. together. And I'll say, I think diversity keeps you uh, in check um, with your own privileges and biases and it kind of keeps you from making stupid mistakes. So I will, I, I definitely think that's kind of true um, just in my mm-hmm. my experiences, but you know, that's important as well. Um, I would like to see a lot more bands have opening bands or local bands who are bands of color, who are female led, uh, who are queer folk. Cause here's the thing, it's like, you know, you go to a show and the band, you know, might be inclusive and talk about all these things, but then, you know, their openers are all, again, cis white boys club, or it's just not, it's not, it's like you're saying this, but your openers are mayonnaise and white bread. Like, what's going on right now? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I use a, sometimes I use food analogies because I love food. So 
<laughs> oh no shame <laughs> don't mind me. same love it um, <laughs> so i mean that's important too and also just like if your friends are booking shows go to their shows you know like the one thing i think that's great with the new york scene and again we're not perfect either in terms of the smaller diy scene but you know people do show your support they do go to shows they you know they, they do what they can and if they can't go to your show they promote it like my friend mike from my Lacerus, um he's just a stand-up human he's like punk rock big brother shout out yes <laughs> shout out my Lacerus. he's like punk rock punk rock big brother um and he kind of just you know always shares like everyone's show stuff in in the I lost his Instagram stories for the day so I was like that's awesome and I'm like yes thank you because here in New York with the smaller scene there could be anywhere from five to ten different shows happening on any given night so it's, it's definitely a lot to kind of like you know take in but there's something for you to go to or something for you to do so I think just like conversations with your friends listening um just kind of being being support for your friends at shows um if they're uncomfortable um and then obviously the venues the publications even music companies really need to do better because you know we're here we're buying merch we're going to shows we're you know doing whatever it's just that you need to actually see us now it's really powerful mm-hmm. um also talk, i mean you mentioned um like going to your friend's shows and whatnot do you have any bands that our listeners should check out any specific bands that you're friends with you know bands of color that could help oh, expand yes. our horizons well, since you guys like are that. pop punk princesses which i love um <laughs> <laughs> yes there yes, yes. That is that. <laughs> there's a band uh called baby got back talk and they yes baby okay. got that's back amazing talk. they are yes. aiming to decolonize pop name. punk um they are fantastic they're basically a political pop punk band and it's amazing like i actually just reviewed uh their first single off their new ep a few weeks ago called um back to before it's great um we have universe ignore her from stan island now i will say the thing about stan island is people kind of forget that it's one of the five boroughs and i hate to say that as a new yorker (laughs) (laughs) i feel (laughs) awful saying that (laughs) <laughs> people kind of forget that Staten Island exists sometimes and they have a scene and Universe Ignore Her is a band that is like almost like this like R&B hardcore um, they're Ooh. just fantastic and I think you know people would really appreciate them um, the 1865 um, I love um, I think they're a good band if you are more of like a punk nerd so if you if you were fans of like let's say like a band like Bad Brains or you know even like ska punk like Fishbone 1865 is amazing. Um, my gals in the Lonely Years are fantastic. They are twee girl punk, so it's almost like a pop punk kind of s band, but still very punk. And they're just lovely humans. Um, for lack of a term, is a band coming from Yonkers. Uh, my friend Arthur plays bass in that band. Um, Arthur is fantastic. He also books, he, he, pre- he pretty much books all their band's tours and then will kind of book other shows in the Yonkers area. So for lack of a term, if people want more like that alternative kind of rock, like I think they're just lovely. And then lastly, my homies in K-Sick, you know, like just amazing, kind of just like fast, like queer punk, just good people, so love it so we uh actually have a spot on our website for playlists that you know based on like what we talk about during the shows and everything some of our Mm -hmm. favorites so we would love to have you curate (gasps) a playlist with all these bands you mentioned and uh share that with our listeners perfect so uh all you listeners out there uh be sure to check out crystal's playlist on www.themoshpitpod.com on your playlist there'll probably be a few more bands on there too that i like but these bands primarily bands led by people of color so because we're talking about that but there's definitely a few more bands i'm gonna throw on there too because i think they're important and i I think people would also like them and bands of color women of color hey let's do it (laughs) exactly we're talking about how to support people how to support the black community Mm -hmm. in the scene what better way than including them in the scene by listening because again they're here they're making music um so y'all need to be listening (laughs) For sure. This has been such an amazing conversation, Crystal. I can't, we can't thank you enough for, for coming on our show and talking to us and, and talking to our listeners. 
I think we're we're gonna wrap it up here. Do you have any any last thoughts, words of wisdom? And keep listening to your friends of color, amplifying our voices. And you know, there's a lot of work to be done in just every area. So obviously we're decolonizing pop punk and you know the music scene, the music industry, which I think has needed to come for a very long time. But also, you know, we're helping to shake things up in the world. And I think it's fantastic. And I know mm-hmm. a lot of my friends have been out protesting. Um, I'm more behind the scenes. So, you know, I'm writing and educating and doing whatever. But, hey, all of our work is important. It all matters. Um, and then to my brown friends and black friends and, you know, women of color and dudes of color and, you know, keep making noise, making music and just be loud and proud and, uh, I thank you guys for having me on. This was amazing. This is my first podcast interview. So thank you for making me uh, feel extra cool. <laughs> oh, we feel so special. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Thank you again so much, Crystal. And uh, just for our listeners, where can they find you um, online? <laughs> out the you world? Can, her address is. You can find me on Instagram <laughs> at scenes from the underground. Great. Again, thank you, Crystal, so much for coming on. Like Kelly said, this was amazing. Definitely eye-opening for us. We want to be able to keep the conversation going. You know, we have organizations listed on our site as well uh, that you can reach, uh, that you can check out, donate, volunteer, whatever, uh, at the moshpitpod.com slash causes. Yeah, and we'll be updating those continuously for you guys. So, you know, we can keep the momentum, keep it going. I'm going to just leave everybody with one last thought from the mosh pit for this episode. Um, And I'm totally going to sound like a cornball, but I am one. It's all good. So it's fine. Music is uh, love. So just love each other. I like it. It is. Hashtag mosh on. (laughs) 